we literally borrowed a Jeep for three days and <laughs> we're putting every sort of wax on the vehicle we could to make sure that the resin yeah, pulled. didn't kill the paint. Everybody, like 30 or 40 races off, I just drove right to the front. I'm like, some dudes follow me, dude. I'm going in the bib. Like, fuck this, dude. I don't tell everyone I'm sorry. I don't want to sell it because I got my hobbies are way too expensive to go live retired life. <laughs> you sound like that dude that was on Jackass and just like getting kicked in the nuts. Like, the one <laughs> Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad original. Today's guest is off-road racing champion, Casey Curry. You can learn more about Casey Curry on Instagram at Casey Curry and at CaseyCurry.com or CurryEnterprises.com, right? Yeah. Uh, Casey, welcome to Oil & Whiskey right here in person, flesh and blood, in studio. Excited to be here. Appreciate you coming out, man. That's a trek. Southern California, yeah. leaving the uh, the beautiful weather you have to come join our uh, negative twenties, negative thirties here. I figured I'm like, if I'm gonna fly back to Chicago area, let's do it when it's at its worst. Yeah, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah, you miss like the sub zero temps by a day, but it's still brutal out there. Today's like summer. Yeah, yeah. we had a fifty degree weather swing. It's negative thirty on Tuesday, and we're twenty two today. It is, uh, yeah, the whole weather thing back here. Well, I mean, I thought at our house, thirty six degrees it shuts everything down. I didn't realize that it goes actually below that. Yeah, oh, way yeah. below. Like, yeah. I'll my, tell you, oh, it's, this is cold. It's tough. You get into that like negative 10, I'll tell you what, it shuts down. That's the fucking plumbing because we, oh. <laughs> we had ourselves a little water situation because of the shit freezes. Pipes start freezing. It's brutal. You just yeah. cold. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, see, we don't even do that. Same with like, you guys have trailers outside with snow on the roof. I'm going like, I don't know if anything I own can actually have snow on it or would it <laughs> rust or fall apart? I didn't think anything out there in California like can exist plus or minus like a six degree window. It's like oh. anything over 79 degrees or anything under like 69 degrees, 60, it sh either power grid shuts down because it's too hot, it's, power grid shuts down because it's too cold. Yeah, I don't know how the, the whole battery thing, it makes, it is funny because when it's, a, if it's over 85 and everyone has their air on, they literally tell you to turn it off during the day because yeah. It's going to go to brown out and you're sitting there going like, okay, so they want everyone to go to electric cars by 2030, but here we can't even run our air conditioners during the day. I saw a good post. I don't know who did it. It was like a meme uh, yesterday, the day before. And it was like in a parking garage and the, somebody had their electric car plugged in uh, to the little inverter thing. And the guy's unplugged it. He's like, I don't get free gas. You don't get free electricity. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in oh. Chicago, we had like, <coughs> no. It was crazy, right? The, all was, the Teslas. Oh, yeah. You they, can't, were, it, they can't handle the cold, cold temps. I guess they w can't heat the battery to charge. Yeah, so yeah, precondition the battery to people charge. People are just like leaving them places. <laughs> oh, hair was full of them. They were trying to yank them out of there. Yeah, everything was just dead. Okay, yeah. It's the whole, uh, I'll pay the taxes. 75 <laughs> degrees almost year round. My kids were wearing no shirts two days ago on riding skateboards. So it's it's crazy to see like, so they're like, what do you do when it's this cold when you're a kid? You go to work. Yeah, right? There you go. You play skateboarding video games <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> we got That's, indoor skate parks. Yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. I don't want to go too far down the path, but <coughs> just for a second, think about, I mean, Elon Musk is a genius, obviously, right? I mean, evil scientist, you know, just goes to space and all that stuff. Created a great car. Engineering feat. But imagine the complaints... It just, oh, it's, oh, yeah, it's too cold. Can't drive it. You just got to throw it away, leave it, abandon it. How many years, and the car builders out there will know, you know this, we know this. How many times you get a, like a customer pissed off back in the day of a, a glove box is going. Tuk, 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 tuk. <laughs> what, like, what's it doing? It's a, tuk, tuk, tuk. <laughs> but only at like 65. Can you come pick it goes, the car up? It goes away at 66. <laughs> But it's 65 miles an hour. Don't drive 65. Try to do like 64 or 66. And granted, we left the interior <laughs> stock, right? <laughs> yeah. But Elon Musk, my you, brand new car when you get a $100,000 car, it's a little too cold. Yeah. No to, driving for you today. Yeah, you're going to want to leave that there. Super funny, though. My, uh, I just did a new interior my 67 Camaro like two weeks ago. And the, the only thing that rattles right now is the glove, glove box. box. Yeah, the yeah. I, I don't know why. It, it never rattled. I didn't even do upholstery inside the glove box. But, but you it, fucked around and then yeah, inside yeah. that car. So, yeah. yeah. I think GM put like two BBs inside the, between the skin and the shell. Like, <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> just fuck with people. Yeah. Yeah. It's the worst design. Uh, so, 
you've been quite busy over the last few years. I, so tell us about recent times, and then we'll we'll hop into you know how young Casey got his start. Right. So I actually just turned forty years old. I'm actually I'm feeling really old now, but uh, you and me both. It's not forties right. that old. Forties forties pretty young. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. So basically, in 2020 in January, I won the car, which is going on right now. Uh, racing UTVs. So first American never win to car, uh, crazy defeat, uh, pretty wild experience. But I basically, the three years before that devoted my, basically my entire life to winning that one race, which it's wild, but travel like 30 weeks, um, a year to focus on that one race. There's that much testing development, uh, and just train to get ready for it. But won that. And then, uh, basically in the year before that, my dad and my uncle owned Curry Enterprises. They were looking at basically retiring, selling the business, but both of them didn't want to sell the business. And uh, my grandpa had a deal with uh, my dad and my uncles, basically, that no grandkids ever allowed to work for Curry. That was the deal, never a paycheck. So I'm 40, so at 36, um, my dad and my uncles were going like, we, we want to retire, but obviously we don't want to sell it because it's our their legacy. And they've never worked anywhere else but Curry, my dad had a part-time job, like right out of high school where my grandfather worked as his only job um, out of the military. But basically my uncles never had a job anywhere but Curry. So they didn't want to give it up. Um, so my dad and my uncle basically sat down in a conference room and basically figured out that, hey, we have a suspension company and an axle company. They look like they're doing about the same amount profit-wise. Why don't we just cut it in the middle? You call that rock jock suspension. We'll call the drivetrain Curry Enterprises, but this way, if Grandpa was still here, he wouldn't be mad that the whole thing for him was money creates sep you know separation. At some point, a divorce or cousins thinking there's you know things are equal. Sure, it's never going to work out. So my dad and uncle basically sat down, put all their assets on the table, cut everything in half, made it so that everything was equal be before anything. So there's no unfairness. And uh, at that point. Uh, my dad basically said, all right, if I, I'm, I don't want to do this. He loves it. He loves, he still comes to the office every single day, but he's, he does, he was done with the day to day, all the, the computer systems and the processes and the manufacturing was growing, but he was also to the point where he didn't want to invest anymore. Cause every time he invested, it was like, okay, five more years before this turns into a profit. And it's like, okay, I don't, he's running out of five I'm, more yeah, years, I'm pretty <laughs> much burn out in five more years. So yeah, we, we came in and, um, I came in in February thinking, all right, here we go. Let's figure out how to run Korean Enterprises and, and turn this thing into bigger than it's ever been. And COVID hit. Oh. And that literally turned into like. Welcome to big business. <laughs> a, first thing we're dealing with is lawyers on trying to figure out if we can even keep the doors open and trying to get contract. We have contracts for the military and we're sitting there trying to figure out to get letters from the military that, you know, make it so we can stay open and yep. How do we keep employees at our facility, right? We sure. I do manufacturing. Oh, that must have worked yeah. out for the, the yeah. like the mill. No. Yeah, we. I thought never, that was the meal ticket right we, there. That was it. So we never actually. I think we had people work home at home for a week and uh, in the office and manufacturing never shut down, but it was wild. Like, just I've never had to deal with lawyers rather than negotiating a contract. And now we're dealing with, you know, labor laws and, and I live in California. So we got a lot of labor yeah, laws. Nobody knew what was going on. We went through a lot of the same stuff and lawyers are kind of oh. like a little wishy-washy. You don't want to commit to anything because they don't want to tell you the wrong deal. It was all oh. uncharted waters. Yeah. We tried dressing up in like fatigues and camouflage. <laughs> like, yeah, we're, it's military. You got, military. God bless the USA. You know, right. if, 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 as long as you're building something for us, for, for the exactly. government, yeah. it doesn't matter how dangerous it is. Yeah, you just right. keep on you doing your thing. Working. Staff up shit, you know, yeah, like double matter. your capacity. The rest of the world, fucking close your doors, go right. home. hundred <laughs> percent. And it was wild. Like, dude, that was, I mean, I'm sure it's the same here, but do you're going to work today? And we were one of the only buildings, you know, we had a full parking lot and you're sitting there like, there's no one else anywhere. Yeah. The freeways were empty. Oh, traffic was amazing. It had to be phenomenal oh, for you in California. Amazing. Like, like, and I live where we live is the biggest nightmare traffic jam ever. We live on the 91 freeway. You Google it. it I live on the Mecca of shit traffic because we're 45 minutes. Well, I'm 40 miles away from LA. So we are the suburbs, you know, from LA. So anyone that wants to actually be able to afford a normal home is where we live. And then you drive into LA to work. 
So yeah. if, for me to leave at seven, if my flight's at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm leaving at four thirty to five in the morning. That's what'd your crazy. commute look like during COVID though? Oh, dude, we, I, so we only live seven minutes away or three miles away, but oh, dude, I'm not kidding. There's no one in California that works. And obviously California, everyone in California takes it as far as they can, right? Take three days off. I'll go four just to make sure I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> There's, so, but anyways, we, uh, so with all that, dude, we, you know, buckle down and just try to figure out how to make it all happen. So the biggest thing for us was just, you know, a lot of the parts that we use are OEM based, you know, from gears and lockers and bearings. Like my dad's bought from the same bearing vendor, Timken, but we have vendors that supply for us and it gets to the point where now nah, we don't have them anymore. You're sitting there going like, like a set 80 axle bearing. What do you, how do you not have them? We bought them for years. Yeah. Yeah. Timken's just not making them. Well, okay, you can go somewhere else. And that was it. There was never like uh no one ever, it always seemed, and I'm sure you guys dealt it even from people like us, but Dude, you get promised a date, and then that day comes, or like, I, I. What do you want me to do? Yeah, yeah. I, I got nothing. I it need. was nice though to even be promised a date because a lot of times it was just, we don't know. It's just like permanently back ordered. Yeah. No ETA. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after after it went on, you know, you're like six, eight, nine months into it, whatever, and it, it just it got to the point where it's kind of like laughable, where it's like, what? Oh, you're you're still calling about that? Yeah, dude. Yeah. We we don't have any. Good luck. Yeah. Not gonna have them. Yeah, and just like you guys, the hard part for us is, you know, we only sell complete rins. We've never really been in the parts business. We just sell complete rins. So without, with you know, missing one bearing, yeah, that, can't. I can't ship anything. Like, so Does, we've actually never, that was something my dad and them uh, really never got into was just selling, com, you know, components or pieces. So we never had any, without shipping complete third members or complete housings or complete, you know, on the off-road side, complete cast for ends, we never had the ability to ship anything. So does that not seem like it was like 20 years ago? <coughs> yeah, it's ancient at this point. Seems like still dealing ever. with the ripples, but yeah. yeah, it does. Well, it's funny now as you go places, you're like, oh, do you guys still have people wearing masks? No, no, no. You're like, oh, but then you go to some places, you go to the airport, you get some interesting people in the airport. Yes, you can, you that's a whole nother <laughs> podcast right but there. But the mask, you're in a car and they're wearing a mask. You're sitting there going like, you're alone in a car that if you turn on recirculating air, you got a filter at this point. Oh, yeah. The mask yeah. stories can go on. Dude, on the, and on. the outdoor ones. Well, the dude riding the, yeah. the riding the Hayabusa with no helmet, but a, with the but fucking a mask. COVID mask on. Yeah. What are the right eye, out like, in front of the shop? Yeah, somebody extended swing arm Hayabusa, oh, no helmet, COVID mask. Somebody should sit him down and read him the statistics. Like <laughs> extended swing arm Hayabusa deaths. <laughs> like, I saw not too long ago. This was a little do dude in a Toyota Tercel, little older dude, mask on, right? Wind is up, and he's smoking. And I see him, and I, he's sitting at a red light, and I see him pull the mask down and take a drag and put it back up in the car by himself. And no, and the wind is up. That thing's just smoke boxed out. I'm like, you look like you've been smoking for a long time. Like, oh. this, the mask is not doing it. You're pulling, like, come on. Yeah. It's nah. it, it's it's hard to, to watch. And even, like, the, that big, like, duck bill one that people started wearing. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Those yes. are exceptionally off-putting because that, you literally look at that person, you're like, something's wrong with that person. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I might actually, now I'm thinking about putting a fucking mask on. Because <laughs> you go through that work yes. to get that type of yeah. mask, yeah, you're, yeah, you yeah. got something bad. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> that is good. That is good. So, but yeah, so then uh, during COVID, literally, uh, with all the issues, started finding new suppliers, new vendors around the world and ended up, it's the, some of the blessings is, you know, like we made our own castings. So we now have, you know, a low ping in casting, uh, uh, for 60 and a 44. Uh, we have high ping in castings for 44 and 60, uh, all of our own NRCs, all of our own housing ends. We now manufacture our, um, basically everything. So trying less and less to rely on the, basically the OEM suppliers to be able to handle it. So we found some fantastic fl suppliers to, uh, be able to completely, handle you know the business as far as keeping the aftermarket alive because i feel like depending on what the oems want the aftermarket you know like a, a company like dana sometimes will the, literally they just it's not by choice they're getting put in a bad situation where they have to do what's right for the company well you said they're like i can sit there and say i'll take a couple thousand they're going like that's fine but yeah. cheap needs thirty thousand of these a month yeah so I, <laughs> you're a couple thousand for the year is just not right. really adding up so, but with that, we've, we've come up with some fantastic product. Um, we started our own gear manufacturer that took longer than I wanted. Uh, but now we actually have 
for all the new Jeeps um, and ev like every 44 and 60, we're manufacturing our own gears uh, with some quality issues in the past and, and just getting supply. We we manned up. This is where my dad, the investment ain't going to come back. He's he's we're deep now. I got I but the investment's gonna, not going to come back for a while. But quality wise, we it's the right gear. We know it's going to make the customers happy. And for you know, for me, I got nowhere to go. And we know that these commitments are going to pay off in the long run. So what did you find on, on delving off into the gear manufacturing itself on what was being done that I, you said you mentioned quality. I would assume a lot of that probably due to, has noise. Yes. And it's all, it's no, everybody in their car that they think it. Well, first things first, <clears throat> half the thing is paying an angle will fix most people's problems, but that's a, that's a whole nother story. Right. But, uh, what did you identify you doing it in, in house that you're like, Oh, this is why they're all fucking making a lot of noise. Yeah. Well, what, it, so for us, what it really came down to was around the world, there's different materials. Every they, there's material types that in different country, they have different ratings. So like even on how much of each material is inside of a forging, what well, we've realized that in certain countries, they can say that it is this quality material, but it, it in another country that might not even be okay or acceptable. So what we realized is, you know, some of the suppliers were like going to countries that the material was just a really bad quality material. So no matter what cut you put on the gear, that the pattern will eventually lay itself over and you're going to get some noise with materials moving. So with that, we did a bunch of homework. Um, we got some blessings uh, with some companies going out of business um, and a lot of these, you know, companies merging where some, when, you know, like for example, with the four wheel parts getting bought and then that turning into a crazy merger, a lot of the people that were there are no longer there. And a lot of the suppliers that were supplying to them are no longer uh, supplying to them. So they're all looking for more work. So we got some great opportunities uh, to get an advancement on making sure that we had the right machines and the right quality material to go ahead and do it. So we started running them um, in uh, some of our own vehicles in January of last year, but I mean, we didn't get inventory until November of our, basically a week before SEMA is when we got our inventory in. Uh, but the commitment is the fact that you basically got to buy thousands of every ratio. They don't, there is no like 30 of these and 500 of these and a thousand. It's yeah. a couple of years supply sitting on yep. the shelf. Yep. That, that's, the, that's the problem with our industry. It's like <laughs> for this industry, you've got big volume. Yep. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're trying to work with any of these larger manufacturers, it's so minuscule. Yeah, it really so got to make those commitments. Yeah. And it really is. It's 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 crazy when you start seeing some of the OEM numbers because you always think like, oh, no, no, we're doing pretty good. Like <laughs> in the industry, we're doing good. And then they're building how many F-150s yeah, yeah. a day? A hundred percent. Your year is there Monday oh, afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it's truly insane to see the production. So. I, I get it, but that's also where I'm like, you know what though? We also need to find there's, I mean, even in America, I think there's a lot of people that can do a great job. It's just, they don't consider themselves, uh, like, a, a vendor for our type of business, even though they do what we do. So you have to go find them. And that's something even for castings and forgings and stuff, there's great companies in America that do a lot of the same stuff we need, but they don't promote or market it. So you're, we have to go find those vendors They're not, not a lot of them are knocking on our door, which they're makes showing it, up at SEMA. Yeah. They they don't even know about it. Like a lot of the stuff they do is trinkets or small things for, you know, a company like that's selling to Walmart. So they are so busy that they don't look at a company that ours and we fit the mold. They just are like, oh, I've never thought about doing so that. It's, it's not on their radar. That's right. right. So it's, you know, with all that, it's been a, I mean, dude, it's been a hell of a freaking four years. And I feel like 2024 is you know, for us, it's like, it's the new beginning. I started a new, we were 16 months into our new computer system. We went live on one, one of 23. So it's been 12 months of learning that, but we were already in it for 12 months before that. And then the computer system, the technology standpoint of career enterprises is where, I mean, my dad was running into old school, man. He has, we, we are very blessed to have some employees that have been with us for over 40 years. So they don't need to come. I mean, they it's get crazy. The part numbers up there. Oh, you literally sit there and go like, that is not even in the bill of material. Yeah, I know, but I know I need it. How long has that not been in the bill of material? <laughs> I don't think it's ever been in there. Why? I never What's looked. What's a bill of material? <laughs> You're sitting there going like, they just know exactly what, but so it's like, 
some of those transitions into the new system and trying to train. It was the new. Well, guys. How do we know when we're out of them? That, well, I know when we're getting low. Hundred <laughs> percent. I talked. To, I just talked to the purchasing guy, and he'd buy me more. I'm going like, did the purchasing guy know that? No, he just knows that we need. I let him. him know when we took the last one. Yeah, yeah. man, dude, for coming into that business, like I can't imagine a worse. <laughs> Shit storm. That's like a shit oh, tsunami. Dude, like to really come up, you got COVID, new computer oh. systems, <laughs> starting new companies, right. manufacturing your own parts. Dude. Oh yeah. And the hard part, I didn't. Want, I mean, here's the deal. It's much easier to just go place a peel and buy a couple of what you need and keep moving on. It just got to the point where like, I don't want to be a disappointment. I only want to build the best quality product we can. And I'm I'm 40 and I'm not. I don't want to sell it because I got my hobbies are way too expensive to go live retired life. <laughs> you sound like that dude that was on jackass that just like getting kicked in the nuts like the one yeah. like, hey, he just he he I think he yeah, enjoys he getting kicked right. in the nuts yeah yeah that's <laughs> well my and now here's where i'm at i'm like dude the, if the harder we push now the more i can enjoy it with my family when they're older my my boys are eight nine and i got a super fantastic wife that allows me to travel and work a lot a lot but man we have a great group of guys at the office and like i'm saying the blessing of the computer system was that the guys in the shop didn't need anything. They knew what they needed by grabbing off the shelf. It was wrong and messing inventory up like a motherfucker. I mean, you literally figure out, can't figure out why you're out of something until they tell you that they're just using it on every order. It's just not in, in that piece of paper thing that you yeah, give it, it says we've got a thousand of them in stock. Yeah. So <laughs> and the bin's empty. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the computer says a thousand. <laughs> yeah. So but it, well, it worked. Hopping it, it, hopping back to you went in the Dracar Noir because I had <laughs> It's not a cologne race. Are you sure? Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, I'd agree to disagree. <laughs> uh, I had no idea. One, I'd love to know more about what all that takes and what you're driving. But winning it, first American, were they super accepting of that? So it's wild. Uh, first things, I, I uh, had a five-year deal with K&M to go out and try to win the car. So first year we went to Peru uh, we, we got fourth place, a bunch of rookie mistakes, um, half on my behalf, some on the team, but overall gnarly good experience. The crazy story is we went to Saudi Arabia and that's where the story gets wild because the same year in 2020, in 2019 is when they started allowing Americans to travel into the country for the first time ever. So we, you know, you're going to a country that people are like, Hey, in the city, everyone knows that you're legally allowed to be here, but you know, when you get further away from the city, which we're racing off road, you know, there's a lot of people that might not know. It'd be like out, a little more redneck out there. A hundred percent. Like I have an American flag. That's two feet by a foot tall on the side of my vehicle. That's good and, marketing. With, yeah. With those, driving through with those so. government contracts, oh, did they help you out with like a yeah. drone? Just a little bit <laughs> out funny, of like, overwatch. Uh, there was some bombing going on right below in the country, right below us. Uh, very blessed. At the hotel, we met some uh, people in the uh, Marines and literally just had phone numbers. <laughs> I had, we got some phone numbers of people within the uh, government that were like, if something ever happens, here's five phone numbers to call, no matter where you're at. You get out of jail like, free card. Oof, it's because, man, it's, it's wild to experience. First, to race in a country that the terrain is super similar to our terrain here, which made it good for me. Uh, but you're going to a country that, I got flown over by the, one of the princes um, in November to do some media stuff uh, before the race in January. And when we flew over there, this is where it gets crazy is we flew over there. And like, you know, when you go into McDonald's, there's a male door and then there's a family door. So, you know, if you're a man, even if you're married, but you're by yourself at lunch, you would walk into a single door that it, you'd go into one side of McDonald's that was all men. And then you would, if you were with your wife and kids, you could walk in the other door and then that's where like the place that would be and the family would sit. When we went back in January, that wall was being taken down and that those rules were changing. The company that, you know, the country is evolving very quickly and it's crazy. Like that's things that you would hear of in a history book here in America and you're seeing it happen. We're yeah. seeing it happen. Like yeah. uh, females driving that only happened. Uh, well, then it was, in 2019 is when females were allowed to, st allowed to start driving. Well, they might so, change that. Yeah. I so said, no one's yeah. going to touch that. <laughs> I, I, I was going to stay away right. from it. Yeah. Just, but it'd be crazy. Give it a year. Dude, dude, like we went out to dinner with, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we went out to dinner with an assistant Too easy. of the like Soft. Prince and dude, she drives a Jetta, but she has a driver. Like for a Jetta, I'm sitting there going like, okay, so if you have a driver. That's a Rolls or something. Uh, yeah. Bentley, like something. But it's like, it's a diesel Jetta. And you're going like, that's huh. 
that's true. But it's just because that's how they grew that's, up. That is wild. But yeah, man, we've gotten, so we got to fly all over and travel all over Saudi, which is a very unique experience. So the race is basically 14 days, 6,000 miles. You have this to, is a Can-Am, the side-by-side? Yep. So you drive every day roughly three to 600 miles, and then, you know, you're racing. There is some liaison, which means highway driving. But no matter what, we, I, you have to drive every day. There, you're sick, headache, stomach ache, it doesn't matter. There, no one else is allowed to drive the car. That's the rule. The driver's the driver. And and you still got support following you with fuel? Yeah, so and- support. So the way it works is once you start the day in the beginning, nothing, no communication to the outside world until you finish. If you there's a box in your car that has your cell phone in it, if you cut the zip ties, that means you've you've told the organization that you're out of the race. Huh. Oh, so you're so you're no, fixing. You've got to take everything. That's you're right. Fixing you take whatever. Everything. What about what you got enough fuel to run? So what they'll do is they put a, they put like this. They're just like oil tankers, like these big gas trucks in the middle of the desert, and you get a time allotment of like 15 minutes, and you're allowed to go up. You pump gas. So, oh, it's. it's like, it's crazy, and dude, that's like all Mad the, Max. Yeah. Oh, the organization is unreal. I mean, there's five, six hundred racers. My team, my just for our team to do that race had sixty people. Because you have you like, dude. There's physios and there's like I might a bus driver like to drove my motor home, and then he has somebody with him to make you know. Because normally the way it works is the drivers would help mechanics all night long and then drive all day, so they need somebody else to help drive during the day. But mechanics, everybody but the semi's driver, they work all night long on the cars. They have to finish by 4 a.m. So we can start between 4 and 5 a.m. every day. And then they would sleep for the couple hours. Is it shotgun start or class start? No, or it's, uh, so it's all time every day. So however you finish the day before is exactly how you start that next day. So there's, you could literally line up, you know, those, have you seen those trash trucks? Yes. Those, they're faster than anything you've ever seen. I mean, you'll, you, it's insane how fast and powerful those things are. But yeah, you'll be in a UTV and I got six of them behind me going like, okay, we get lost. Five ton trucks are just going to mow you down. Just mow you down. And they are gnarly and fearless. Like what's your average speed for the day? Um, I would say in the dirt, probably 40 to 45 miles an hour. So the problem over there is there's a lot of sand. So the sand just kills the speeds. And then they put a restrict, they put restrictors on the cars to make it. So that way, by doing the restrictor on the inlet makes it where it's, it's easier to like, they keep everyone same because otherwise like, no matter how you tune the car, when you can only get so much air inside the motor thing is slow as shit. No matter how what. stock is your, uh, mm. the, like the, the cases of the motor. Okay. Everything has tube <laughs> chassis, tube chassis, all complete carbon fiber cockpit, carbon fiber body, and then two spare tires on the back. It holds like shit. I think, 50 gallons of fuel and it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, you, obviously you're paying attention, but are you, you, are you up on it? White knuckling the whole time or are there times where you can kind of zone like, I mean, do you pop in like a podcast and like (laughs) cell phone, cell phone, cruise and Instagram. The hard part is, is there's no navig. So it's all navigation based. So as a team, like me and my co-driver together, he's, you know, it's all cap headings. So it'd be like, all right, cap, cap 30. Well, that like at, you know, you'll drive on a road, let's say for, it's all kilometers, everything. You have to learn kilometers, by the way, but everything's in kilometers. You have to drive six kilometers. And then uh, at six kilometers, you're just going to make a 90 right and cap 30. Well, so if you go five and a half miles or five and a half kilometers, and then no matter what, you're now parallel to where you need to be. So when you get out, you know, 20 kilometers away, you're going to miss the waypoint. And now you got to figure out where it is, which Shit. this is where, how you, you would be great at that part of it. It's all numbers. Nev- it's, maybe it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some things that like I would aspire to do. That's probably just not the, really for me. The driving part, I think would be, yeah, I could drive the shit out it, of that thing. It's yeah. the, fuck, which rock, which rock, yeah. fuck, we'll yeah. turn around. Well, it's what, dude, and that's where, like, now, that's where the, like, you're not driving necessarily 100%, but he could read notes, four or five notes ahead, right? Like, he'll be like, hey, in five notes, um, there's a reference point, a uh, set of telephone poles, uh, so, uh, something in the road, there's five tires. So what, this is where it comes into, like, even if you're lost, if he's, if you're working as a team, 
you could be like, no matter what happens for the next five things, you said telephone poles, no matter what, I know they're right there. So is there any waypoints in between there? No. Okay, no matter what, if we get lost or we feel uncomfortable, I know for a fact that we'll just hit the telephone poles and then we'll run down the telephone poles. So like this is where it comes into like being a team and just strategizing how you're communicating because you never want to just be on that note. You want to and be And don't like, give you too much information, but don't give right. you no, I don't like I don't like when people call out like 500 meters, 400 meters. Like, I got it, dude. You're literally in a quarter mile. Turn yeah. left. Yeah. <laughs> so well, who's pre-running this for all the notes and stuff? The organization does it like three months before the race and that's it. So when you don't get to pre-run at all, none. you see none of it. You get to see absolutely nothing. And that's what's wild as well. Cause I didn't have this problem, but last year they had weather. It's well, the course sand, had to go across man. water that was flowing at like 40 miles an hour. You just skip it. Was it was washing, just washing the TVs away completely. Dude, there are people like inside the car window nets up. But I mean, the hard part is the race organization, they don't call it unsafe until basically somebody dies. So there's people fully suited Shit. swimming with ropes trying to get to the other side. So that way they can get like a couple of locals to help hold the front. So while the UTV is dragging down the water. But that and the problem is like you can sit there and fight it at the end and they're it's it's FIA. They don't. Yeah, I get it. You lost 30 minutes. The th top three guys didn't lose any time. So, sorry, you lost an hour and a half. You're like, well, that's that's it right there. Shit. Cock the wagon and forge the river better than Dude, you did. A little Oregon right. trail action. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, and, oh, and you do some mountain ranges. Like, we did this one seven foot eleva uh, elevation, 100% sand dune. Like, I look for us in California, we have this mountain called Big Bear Mountain. It, it'd literally be taking the entire mountain and making it sand. And you have to drive from top to bottom, but there's pockets and then there's the sand, the soft sand areas. And then all these areas where if you go up and over, it'll, it, some areas will just be flat and rolled. And then the next one will be a complete drop off on the other side. And then the other thing is, is like, you bring in paddle tires dude, to get through that stuff. I or? wish I, you're not even, the problem is you can't change tires. And change then, tire pressure. Yep. Yeah, you can do that. But here's the deal. If you want to stop for it, cause there might be rocks before it or rocks after it. So you can't really, and there's no, we don't have a compressor on board. So, and if I don't, I wouldn't want to stop. So you just, we study the day and then we adjust because shocks in the sand, you want to be firmer, but on the rocks, like firmness on the rocks, just it's punctures because now the suspension's holding the tire. So, you know, holding the tire down the ground, making the tire do all the work, which when rocks aren't being driven on all the time, which there it's, all fresh train, it literally makes punctures. Like today in Dakar, I don't know if you're following it, but punctures were all over the map today. It's second day from the finish, and they made this gnarly day where people, the guy that was winning it overall got three flat tires and only has two tires. So now his teammate had to wait for his teammate that gave, basically gave him all his tires. Oh, it's gnarly strategy. That's, well, that's a lot. All, all I can think of as you're talking, we're thinking like Dunes, Saudi. I just keep thinking of like a, Early 2000s Camry, white Camry or Toyota Forerunner, <laughs> yeah. winning, winning it. Like right. those dudes, oh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. you're out there like cranking in full race gear, and these dudes just <laughs> four, four yeah. deep, yeah, <laughs> Come, hanging out the window like what's, oh, what's up on two wheels. The Nissan Patrol with a huge yeah. turbo yeah. motor. We uh, raced in Abu Dhabi. Uh, like, what, see, this is where it gets crazy. They focus their whole year around focusing on the cars. So, like, you race in all these countries that have similar terrain. So that we can kind of get used to it because they don't ever do it really any other races in Saudi. But we raced in Abu Dhabi and all you could see is like there's these long roads in the sand, like paved roads that at any time there's an intersection, dude, there's burnouts. Every, you, all those videos of the dudes driving backwards at 90 miles an hour. Yeah. That's real. Is it really? Oh, <laughs> they it like real, real to the point where like oh. that stuff is going down all the time. Damn, we I've lost hours to Saudi yeah. training on Facebook. I think it was even yeah. before Instagram. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Like like mid like 2000s, we got on a kick on that, and that was like the hottest <laughs> the thing. Bicycle drifting. S Saudi yeah. drifting. Yeah. Change, taking the tires off on two wheels. <laughs> yeah. 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 But the shit they can do, I mean, it's true talent. Yeah. You got dudes, I mean, the, obviously, like, life or death, they don't really, like, fear death. Right. They're up on two wheels, hanging out the passenger side windows, and those fuckers can drive. Dude. Yeah. And it, but it's crazy seeing it, like, there's just these roads uh, out in the middle of the sand dunes, and but you, black tire marks everywhere. I Damn. mean, they are ripping. So, Dakar, up. the race is different locations every year. 
So it's like right now, I think the cunt, so the country helps pay for the rally. So right now they're on a five year contract with Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the, as far as the course goes, yeah, it's basically all over the country. They used to do it in Africa too, yep. didn't they? It's been in Africa and then it went to, uh, I don't even know where it went, uh, after Africa. I, um, but I do know that it went to Peru for five years and then I went from Peru. That's, I went to Saudi, but I did Peru once, which is another interesting, that's a, just a totally different country as well. Like totally different. And the, the crazy part is the transition Dakar was designed around like these people sleeping in the outdoors and like, you know, 14 days of like no sleep. And, you know, the goal is to wear yourself out. So your body's mentally drained while your team is mentally drained. And like, by the end of it, everyone is exhausted, but like the real men survive. And dude, now it's like Prevost motorhomes and <laughs> semis. You get and, the helmet toter that shows up uh, and hops in. And dude, there is massage therapists. Ball <laughs> and four of them per team. <laughs> Cooks, chefs, like because it's in Saudi, there's a lot of money in Saudi, but there's also a lot of racers that are now getting involved with rally that before it was just about being rough, tough, dirty, no shower for a week. Now it's like, there's wealthy people getting involved in the sport, which is like bringing the bougie out now. I mean, there are some sick ass setups out there for motorhomes and Damn. trailers and stuff like really? big, big money. I, uh, one of the racers has like six, probably 45 foot, uh, like they're freight liners, but I, when they're not, I think they're mans, um, but they're buses, but each bus is like, he has a hangout and then he has a kitchen and then one that's his personal, like, a bedroom, like instead of doing a motorhome where the bedrooms in the back, like it's got five, it's, community. it's, got it's, five community. it's insane money. It's cool to see, but the evolution of it is definitely changing. Hey everybody. I'm Andy Stumpf, host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents. For over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. What's the like diciest thing you've seen out there between, I mean, all of Peru, Saudi. Um, for me, I would say the hardest thing, well, the scariest part is being in the sand dunes. So your buzzer beeps when you're going backwards. Cause for safety aspect, it'll make sure that if you're, if you're going head on with another vehicle, it's not if you're going backwards. Cause you remember you can go any which way you want. Sure. If you're going in a direction that you're going to go head on, your buzzard will beep. The worst in our feeling ever is being in the sand dunes knowing there's trucks behind you, but now you're going backwards and the buzzer's going off. But the Ooh. problem is you can't stop because you'll get stuck and then you don't want to be, you don't flat, there's no whips. So like, you don't want to be, you're, I've been- Starting in, to crest. You're just waiting for a truck to go the other side. And they said so tall that, you know, that it's it's something that happens. Like, dude, they, when they hit you- It's done, game it's, over. Oh yeah, it's gnarly. Because you'd go right under the front and it happens, but that's that feeling of like, not having a way to be like, dude, we're on the other side of the sand dune. Like the buzzer's going off. Like I, we need you to go back another, you know, 500 kilometers or, you know, 500 meters to reset. And you're like, dude, I don't even know how to get there. And the problem is like, you want to go on the most traveled path because the sand dune literally, you know, a hundred feet the other way could be super soft sand or a pocket or a witch eye. Cause all that there is, I mean, it's just about as glamorous where, Dude, you can sit there and completely smoke the front end off your car. Yeah. Doing nothing. So, but that, yeah, that stuff is not. The other thing is, is like, I got followed one time in, in one of the big cat towns. And I don't know if it's because it's American. We fully ran, but like we had a black suburban follows from um, like 70 miles 
in the middle of the desert all the way into town. Every lane, every lane choice. I, I, we were like full blown freaking out in the car. Can't do anything. Get security at all with you? No, nothing. We were driving down the highway. Well, so what we did, we drove down the highway. He was, I mean, full blown blackout. We were trying to like get next to see what it was like if, but ready for anything. But I mean, he was full blown following us. No idea what it was, but we ended up getting into town. He followed us all the way, got off the freeway, followed us all the way there. And then when we were getting to the bivouac where all the racers stay, there was a, cause you normally just wait in line for them to like stamp your card, make sure you're all good. Dude, I literally fucking cut everybody, like 30 or 40 races off. I just drove right to the front. I'm like, some dudes follow me, dude. I'm going in the bivouac. Fuck this, dude. I don't tell everyone I'm sorry. It's probably one of those Marines that gave you a Yeah, I know. I was like, dude, I just wanted to say What's hi. What's it like when you're on like regular roads and like, just cruising, no yeah. window, dude, just at no stair, like nothing, dude. In the first year I went, I had a French, uh, uh, co-driver that didn't even speak English and like, you just get on the highway, just dude, five or six. Cause it'd be, are you to abide by the local speed yeah, limits? But kind of, kind of, yeah, it's gray area. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, that's another whole crazy story, but you'd just be sitting on the highway, dude. Do it. You have a speed limiter that you're only allowed to go, but yeah, you're on the highway for six hours, just cruising five in the morning. Cause normally what they do is you'll race six hours. And then normally it's about three to five hours of liaison either before or after. So you're like, they could have you wake up four in the morning and then get on the highway for four or five hours and then sure. race after that. Or it could be like from the bivouac, we're going to race and then it'll be four or five hours on the highway. Cause you're putting in some miles every day. But yeah, they're, oh, like I've been in Peru in the mountain ranges. Problem is you're you still have to get to the bivouac before a certain time. Dude, windy roads, sketchy, rainy, passing semis, wrong, no, can't see on the other side. And my co-driver at the time, he's like used to it. I'm saying like, I feel like I'm going to die. But he's like, dude, you're just, we're getting late. And it's like every corner we're passing cars and shit. So you're racing to the race. Oh, 100%. Because <laughs> as long as you don't speed. You're not racing, but the problem is you get to a place and there's traffic. Well, now your clock's counting down and they usually give you 20, 30 minutes extra, but you know, it goes like maybe five or 10 minutes, right? When the race is over five or 10 minutes, take your helmet off. Okay. We're done. Now we'll just drive a couple hours back to the bivouac. But then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're, we're late now. Like the traffic in that town, we need to now, you need to drive. It's party. What's you've done Baja, right? Yeah. So how is the difference? So Baja, like the ball 1000, I've won that uh, three different times. That's a thousand miles straight. You start, no matter what happens, you're finishing like, or you're DNFing and going home, but there's no strategy for the day as far as like having a plan for tomorrow. It's all out. It's balls out. That's it. And then on top of that, there, yeah, it's literally you strategize off who's in front of you, behind you, but you're just pushing all day long and, and running flat out wide open. So, but, and to me, that's where it gets different. And you have an, uh, you're allowed to pre-run. You can go down there and spend a couple of weeks, get super good notes, know where you're going to pass people. So it's a totally different process and like, of just going out and having more fun. But I love Baja. And, uh, just cause you get to like the racing aspect of it in rally. If you're racing somebody like they could be driving, which happens in rally, you'll literally be hauling ass racing somebody thinking. And if your co-driver gets lazy and goes like, just follow him. And now you're racing. <laughs> I've done it before where you're literally going like, fuck dude, we just went 20 miles the wrong direction. We are following him the wrong way. He turned right. We we're supposed to go left. Ugh. And now you're like, well, that's 20 miles back now. Now you're 40 miles right. in the wrong direction. But uh, in Baja, you have a course and you know exactly where you're going. So that's now the mindset is like, Hey, what's over that B blind rise, keep it wide open rocks, ditches, and you keep there's the notes is a different style note, but very much so, uh, it's still wide open fun racing though. Yeah. Baja awesome. looks like a blast, man. Are, are the locals like sabotage that? I, I watch it on so, TV. Is there's like, the booby trap thing. Yeah. So I, it's not, I, it's no. just like everything else, right? It'd be like saying I'm never going to Chicago because it's super freaking dangerous. Hey, it kind of is, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think really, uh, you know, it does happen. There's some situation, you know, you do have to be careful, but I think you just more so just understanding where you're at and what you're doing and you'll be all right. You guys should come down sometime. Dude, I'd love to. It'd be fun. I could say, we'll take you guys pre-running. 
That'd be cool. That'd majority be of the locals down there, they they're like into it, right? That's oh like yeah, the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's it's badass. Everyone loves it down there. Like for the most part, everyone loves it. Now there's cartel stuff like that, but just try. You don't right. drive yeah, places at late at night yeah. and sketchy neighborhoods. Yeah, right. You're just trying to make a living. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or you take a couple bundles for them. <laughs> right. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> so in comparison to Dakar, what's like mile an hour? You're running because you're running fucking wide open out there. So in, yeah, in Baja, I mean the speeds are probably. Average over a thousand miles is still 55 miles an hour. It's, so yeah. it's the speeds are much greater because you know the terrain, even though it's rougher because now everyone's pre ran on it and there's whoops. Like the car, there's no whoops because no one's ever created the whoops. But in Baja, there's a shitload of whoops. But you know exactly where you're going to go. So the speed is, you know, you basically know how fast you can go without getting in trouble. What kind of car did you run out in Baja? So I built a, I have an all wheel drive. It's basically an all wheel drive trophy truck. So uh, I built it so I can race the King of the Hammers and the Ball 1000. So it's it's got like a 930-ish horsepower LS motor in it. It's got a 4L80. Um, and then we have a, it's a Fortin transfer case with a Sprague gear in it on the front. So basically it doesn't put any load on any of the drivetrain uh, under braking. And then it's just got one of our independent center sections in the front and then straight X on the back. It's uh, 24 inches of travel in the front and I think... 29 in the back Damn. so coilover bypass and air bumps all the way around so it's a that's a fun yeah. let's pre-run that then yeah that's yeah, a fun, yeah yeah fun little <laughs> toy there <laughs> <laughs> honestly the best thing to pre-run in is utvs that the market is i mean speed wise and fun wise dude it's just unreal what you can do in a utv like if you guys honestly came down to mexico or any event for that matter i can it all, you'd literally have a blast in a UTV. So you just go all day long. That yeah, sounds like that there. trip. June, yeah. June. if you want 500s in June, thousands in November. Thousand, you know, it could be, well, okay, look, it could be cold for us Californians, right? It could be. Yeah, we're still shorts. And yeah, 100%. Oh, you would literally, yeah. I got it. My semi driver's from Wisconsin. He's always wearing <laughs> shorts yeah. and it's, in California. It's like, it's never cold. I'm like, <laughs> so, but honestly, you guys should try to come out sometime. Be a remote oil and whiskey podcast from, oh. from the 500. I'm that'd down. Be, yeah, that'd be cool. So you you, you mentioned earlier that you know uh, granddad and dad nobody wanted any anybody working there. So you this is all new to you. So back one, how did how you know how did you get to start in the motorsports? What you racing? What jobs did you have before since you couldn't work for the family business? So I uh, right at a, in college, uh, like two years in, started like I was in business management marketing. Uh, I wrote like a business proposal strategy for a motorcycle shop and literally uh, started a dirt, an online dirt bike shop and actually had a couple employees was doing really good. And then my dad had the idea. I was trying to go racing, which is a crazy story, but how that happened, which will twine in is I went to dinner with my dad and actually a, a marketing guy that worked at Detroit locker Eaton and they were in California pitching Nissan like concept cars for SEMA, like, you know, back in the day, the dollar car, well, they still sure. do, but the dollar car deal and their ideas got turned down from Nissan. So they threw out my idea that I would like, I was like, Oh, if I ever got to build a freaking car for SEMA, this is what I do. Well, that my idea got accepted by <laughs> Nissan. So that dude called my dad and was like, you're not going to believe it. They actually liked your son's ideas more than ours. So if he wants to build a car, you can build it. So I literally built a Nissan. Uh, it was, a, uh, 2008 is when the, uh, Nissan Frontier came out, the new body sound, Nissan Frontier came out. So I built this bitch in like short course looking truck and then had to go present it in front of uh, everyone at Nissan. All the dudes at Nissan came out and were like, hey, we hear that you want to race off-road trucks. If the opportunity ever came, we'll sponsor half the budget of what it would take to run the rest of the year. All you have to do is come up with half. Hmm. So without ever driving anything. So I literally busted my ass and I was own, I owned the dirt bike shop. Well, my dad's like, you have a super successful business and you're going to throw it all away to go racing. He's like, so he had a friend, Kurt Leduc, who's like a, a big offered racer. And he was like, Kurt, go tell Casey that, you know, this shit ain't going to work. So Kurt <laughs> came and talked to me. He's like, look, dude, where you're at in your life, like you can't have multiple ventures going on. Like you, it's all in on one thing. That was his whole deal. He's like, you need to stay committed to one thing until you're really good at it before you go venture off onto something else. Cause having two things grow at the same time, just not going to work. So I was like, you're fucking absolutely right. I literally listed my dirt bike shop that night. 
And my dad's like, you fucking yeah, you didn't it. tell him the wrong. You, f- you told You're a little vague. You went the wrong way. So my dad was like, it went the wrong way. Appreciate the advice, dad. Right? Interpretation issue there. So I, uh, dude, You're I the best, literally dad. sold my dirt bike shop. And uh, it was funny. I sold my dirt bike shop. And Nissan came with money, sold the dirt bike shop, used some of that money. Uh, Did actually, you double the budget for Nissan? Yeah, so then dude. they paid half, which is still the whole yeah, thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was their factor team. I didn't even have, it was their whole involvement. So it was actually a pretty amazing deal. And then uh, Nitto Tires came on board, paid the other half. We went racing. And then from there, that whole deal just evolved. And it just kept evolving. And where the transition to Curry was when Nissan, it's crazy how new CEOs change everything. But like in June of, I think it was 2009, they got a new CEO <coughs> and we got a call from our motorsports director going like, look, I'm getting let off. There's no more motorsports. Um, they com- they don't want to do racing mm-hmm. anymore. They're going to go do tennis and all the, the mo- motorsports money is going to go towards tennis. So just letting you know. So I told myself I was uh, in 2012. I was like, well, dude, I'm not going to run the body for free. I'm like, screw that. I might as well just go do something that'll help my dad's company. So I went and I rented a Jeep uh, body. I, rent, I went to a U-Haul or a Penske and I rented a Jeep. I went to a fiberglass shop and had him splash. I molded the whole thing, <laughs> created a mold, put it on my race car. And I was like, fuck it, dad. I'm just going to, uh, I'll rock it. So that way all my sponsors were like, I'll just rock a Jeep and we'll put curry on it. So at least I can help curry like stoke you guys out. Well, it ended up being that at the time I was with BF Goodrich tires and a couple other brands were like, dude, Jeep is one of our biggest markets, but there's no one racing Jeeps. Like, Dude, we this is a great like marketing tool. We'll turn it into. I want to go back to the dude that rented that Jeep. After <laughs> oh, the fact, I know. Like, there's shit yeah, all there's over this shit. thing. Uh, just, everywhere. It's like this thing smells like resin. Dude, it's like we were <laughs> playing all the gaps. We were like, what the oh, you literally. We had slime and all. You slid the, right past that story. That was the best part. Oh, right. <laughs> What's funny now, looking at it, is like we literally borrowed a Jeep for three days, and <laughs> oh, oh man, I remember pulling it off in one piece because we were so stressed out that we didn't want to have to do it again. Cause I also didn't want to mess the body up on the Jeep to get flagged for something going yeah, that's on. That's like $50 a day rental too. Yeah. So. Right. hundred percent. No, dude, we literally, it was, we, all I did was go to a boat shop. Uh, they're making, they're making boats. I didn't even go to a race car shop. I went to a boat shop and, uh, literally asked him to just make a mold. And we've, Oh dude, it was, it, that is a good story. But we literally <laughs> were putting every sort of wax on the vehicle we could to make sure that the resin yeah, pulled. didn't peel the paint. So yeah, and anyways, after that, like the evolution, uh, I ended up buying a building next door to Curry Enterprises uh, Racing. And then with that, uh, yeah, when uh, everything was going good, rocking it. And then whatever, yeah, four years ago, my dad, when they made that decision, it just, I feel like uh, my grandfather, he helped, he was a huge advocate of everything I did. He, like all my cousins, super successful. All of them had their degrees. I dropped out of college. That's my claim to fame in the family. I'm the only one that dropped out. Started making money. I was like, dude, screw this. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm better making money than going to school. But yep. all my cousins were very successful. But uh, my grandfather, like humongous car guy himself, and just he loved everything I was doing as well. So he supported me. And like, I feel that everything he did in life uh, at his older ages was uh, aligned me for the right opportunity for things to happen. And in 2019, if where I bought my building and my grandfather was a part of the purchase of my building. And he really helped make sure that everything went right when I was buying it because I was so young and buying a building in, in California. Uh, when he did that, literally it felt like he aligned it. So when the time came, I was like, I was ready to go. Like I was, I never worked at Curry. I never got a paycheck from Curry, but from 2014 to 2020, I was at Curry every day. I knew every employee. I knew exactly the process. I knew everything going on. Just a huge advocate. I loved, obviously, I love rear ends, and I love cars, trucks, Jeeps. And uh, so the transition over was really, like, it actually didn't go very hard because I already knew kind of where, what I would do differently. You still got the race shop now? Yeah, so I still have the race shop, but I... So I'm glad that I'm glad that piece of advice really stuck with you about being all in on one thing with the race shop and then oh. you know a new business and then oh, let's go ahead and do a new computer system. Oh fuck, uh, COVID. Yeah. Let's start a new ring and pinion gear a well, company. <laughs> you gotta have somewhere to throw all the money away, right? right? Oh, I'm just saying. Well, the crazy <laughs> so thing racing was, does a pretty good job of that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, ble- the blessing that I had during COVID was, and I will say, like one of my big sponsors is Monster Energy, and like, did they are 
truly one of the most amazing companies. They run it like it's a small company. The CEO still looks at everything. The, the, the company is very passionate about their athletes. If you know, they don't actually do any marketing the normal way, right? They do all their marketing through athletes and through amb ambassadors and events. And when I was like, hey, man, I'd really like, I really want to start looking at like focusing my race program kind of around career enterprises, meaning like I want to race the trophy Jeep that runs all my dad's, you know, axles. And I really want to do more events that are Jeep related or, you know, car related. And they were literally like, yeah, fuck it. We'll change everything. Literally, like at this point, you don't, we don't need to focus on all the other things that you were doing and living wildly. And they're like, whatever you want to do, we'll just tie it with Curry. And so now like Monster is a huge sponsor in a lot of the events that we go to for Curry. Uh, Monster ties in, like they take really good care of my dad for going to events. And then my dad, you know, like it's kind of now my marketing. I'm like, dad, I need you to drive a Jeep and go to this event and hang out. Just be the guy. It's the opposite now. Cause yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, I got to say back. I hate that. I have to like, dude, I cannot leave but the whole ERP thing. I'm like, every day I leave, they'll sit there and make a decision in the beginning of the ERP, we all sure. know, you guys all know that you can make a decision today that six days later, you can't go back and revise that because it's six days of other changes that basically go, you'd have to go back and reset everything. So anyways, during COVID, uh, my dad did a lot with monster and, but the tie together made it where it was really, it really allowed me to focus on curry and every event monster loved all the lifestyle events we went to. And then the racing being with my trophy Jeep, was that it was bitching loud and it tied into everything that they wanted and it tied into everything that Curry had going on at the same time. Damn. Be cool. So it's been a, it's been a, but yeah, dude, I got race shop and Curry. It's, it's an adventure for sure. A lot of things going on. Yeah. What's your grandpa's story? Where, where did he come from? What was he doing? So dude, my grandpa was in the military and when he got out of the military, he lived in orange California, uh, which is where we were 15 miles away from there today real big movers uh but he um started working for a company called taylor dunn they make industrial golf carts i don't know if you ever heard of them they're like yellow yellow industrial carts for like the ones that run around SEMA all the that's time. right um and what he, he him and my grandma were like number two and three employee for taylor dunn um and he helped on the process side of it he was a big process manufacturing guy and all those golf carts ran nine inch for ends and that Did they really yep that, all of them so a lot of the taylor dunn if you look back at taylor dunn carts they got a nine inch for them and that literally good yeah. source for pro street cars yeah then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> straight up little tiny little things for everybody that doesn't know that yeah. if you're scouring facebook marketplace no, where, were they, lean nine inch. Cart. where were they getting those from <laughs> junkyards junkyards so, cutting them down cutting them down so that's where basically my grandpa this is where it gets crazy <clears> my <throat> grandfather never actually worked for curry enterprises what he did was well he had four sons and they're all expensive. So what he did was create a side side hustle and his side hustle was building Rins for Taylor Dunn. So what do you do on the nights and weekends when my oldest uncle um, was old enough to drive? Like he went and they got a, a big old uh, cab over truck and they would go to junkyards torching out Rins. You make the story sound like he was taking care of the sons, but you realize that was just You've got kids. Those are that's cheap yeah. labor. Hundred oh, percent. Oh, <laughs> dude, my dad and uncles, uh, like my uncles, have never from like 12, 14, six, they've never had another job, and that's all they've ever done. Like Curry is true. If you really look like how I look at it now, like I'm obviously here to grow the business. I went to school. I, I blessed to be around all these companies, and blessed to have a company that has a fantastic foundation. My dad and them just loved it. It was never about the growth. It was never about going out and trying to figure out how to make this thing grow into something big. They just truly loved what they did and they loved the industry and everything else. But that's where it gets wild. Those of my grandfather did all that until the kid, my dad, I think was 17. He was uh, right out of high school. He went to work for Taylor Dunn for like four months to being an engineer. And then after that, my grandfather was like, dude, look, I'm going to retire from Taylor Dunn, but I'm also going to retire and you guys need to just buy Curry Enterprises, which the reason it's Curry Enterprises is my grandpa was like, I'll do anything for a dollar. I'll, I'll hustle on the side. And we'll basically, he was also doing VA conversions. His bit, he was a, all his buddies, he was doing all the VA conversions for his buddies. So like in and Jeeps or uh, no, no, no golf carts, trucks. It was, uh, okay. I can't, it was F 100s with the, what's that Chrysler big, the big block Chrysler motor. 
four sixty. That's me. My I, I can't remember. Cobra the Jet the four. Uh, I don't know. I that's see. This is where my dad telling the story would be better at it. But but he's he, calling it Curry Enterprise because he never knows what's the next. He does, hustle. That's right. He'll do <laughs> anything. Just, he'll do anything. <laughs> that, his whole thing is he all he wanted to do was make enough money to make sure the family was good. So that's that cool. he literally uh, went. So that's where. The crazy part is, is my grandfather created Curry and the rear end side just to funnel rear ends to uh, Taylor Dunn. And then my dad and uncle started there. And then my dad and uncles were into building Jeeps and uh, they were super big into like muscle cars and hot rods like my grandfather was. So they just started building rear ends out of junk. Like literally you take them, put them in an oil tank, pull, get all the grime off them, cut them down and respline some axles. That was something my grandpa did. He figured out the program to make it so he can spline his own axles. So huh. it's a pretty unique little story there that he uh, yeah. literally found the program. He made his own program to spline the axle, like all one cut. Everything gets done in a way that the axle rota- you know, rotates in a way that everything is done the right way. And dude, we've been running the same program since like the 70s. It's crazy. Still <laughs> running it to this day. Your machine is secret recipe, huh? That's cool, man. Your grandpa sounds like a hell of a dude. Oh, dude, he is a, and the crazy, he was just a family man. He never, he's the same way as my dad. They never, he just did it because he loved it. Same with all his cars. He was like super big. I was actually listening to one of your podcasts yesterday on the way here and with Jesse James. And, you know, it's crazy hearing Jesse talk about, you know, him working for Boyd because my grandpa had a car built by Boyd. And I guess at the time, Jesse was a fabricator there. And Jesse welded a roll cage. My grandpa wanted to go 200 miles an hour, so he built a 1932 Roadster. And then Boyd helped build it and stretch it and then put the cage in. And then Jesse helped weld the cage together to make Damn. it so it's legal. How That's the, crazy because I was How did the welds look? Right? It's decent? Or? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. It's still there. The whole thing is still sitting on the floor. I want to go. I Let's get do, some pictures of that. Dude. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I went out. My goal, I want to go 200. I want to beat, I want to drive faster than he did. That's what I want to think. In I've the never same been. car? Uh, yeah. No, because now, dude, the rules have changed so much. It would ruin the car now. The rules have gotten crazy on the roll cages. So I wouldn't, the car has been completely restored and it's, it's yeah. showpiece now. Yeah, it's a showpiece. But I'd like to go, I'd like to do 210. I don't want to go any faster. Just double the power in the all wheel drive trophy truck. Right. I'm sure it'll figure it out. <laughs> it's like a freaking, that thing is like a, a brick. Sale. Oh, it yeah. just but I'll bet you get there pretty quick. I mean, what that thing probably does 120, 130. 125, 130. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, he, my grand, but it, the crazy, like Marcel, you know, the body guy, yeah, like Marcel his son, Luke is my, our neighbor. Really? How we, what's he doing nowadays? Is he does, he still does metal work on, he still does metal work for some of those, like the big fendered cars yeah. that like. Della Hayes. Yeah. And Bugattis. And then he actually just built himself a complete, his own car. Like he had a frame built and built his. I a, saw that. That's right. Complete. Where the fuck um, do we see that? Pretty crazy little Grand build. Grand National ass. Maybe. Uh, he did. Uh, I had a SEMA, I think, a year ago. Yeah, that's a talented family. So, He's oh, still building bodies for Rick Door on those things. I don't know. He was building I don't those. actually know him. But he's a little. So he has his shop is in the front of his house on our street. It's crazy. It's shit. And you know, like, you just that's learn wild. all this from COVID. Like, we learned who all our neighbors were because just like anyone else, like. You didn't know that beforehand? Uh uh-uh. uh. That's a good resource if you need like a little oh, right? shapely I, little fender flare or he's something. Got, yeah. Dude, the tools he has in his shop are phenomenal. And like, I've heard stories of his dad and all the work his dad has done. And it's it's crazy seeing all those, you know, all those tools. And he still has a lot of that stuff in there. But it's it's pretty wild. But anyways, these stories though of coming back, it's crazy because my, gran- like, my grandpa was so into it. Like, and his connections of, you know, him and Boyd were friends. And my gran- <coughs> grandpa was into real estate and rented uh boyd's wheel company was in my grandpa's building Shit. so my grandpa ran boyd wheels on everything he owned so he's nuts what did and you do when he defaulted on the but it went to rent that's why he had there boyd was wheels like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, everybody will always yeah. have boyd wheels yeah. in the curry family <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, in perpetuity yeah yeah but yeah he was a dude just a gnarly car guy and uh he and jeep guy like he he loved it all. And then I think all, I literally see my dad and my uncles are like, a li- they're 30% of my grandpa. My dad is super into off-road racing. My uncle's super into jeeping. And my, I have another uncle uh, that's just really into muscle cars and, and loves it. And like somehow I ended up in the shit storm of like being good friends with my uncles and my dad and my grandpa. And wow, dude, I got a shitload of cars. I'm 
Damn. I'm that guy. I'm well, dude. I'm I'm no different than you guys. I tour in your shop. I feel it's, way it's always, better talking right <laughs> here because like it's, your shit probably runs though. Ours nah, is all like, no, I got know, half disassembled. No, I, got, and, I got a Camaro that has a rattly uh, glove box. Yeah, that, that one runs right now. It's done. I, but now I got a Mustang. That I moved the motor back, and then when I moved it back, I didn't have to cut the firewall out, and then I cut the firewall out, and then I had to cut the transmission tunnel out, and then, then I got into that, and then it's like we should move the radiator, and that's snowballs. Yeah, it's tough when you just like everything, you know. Because it yeah. sounds like I mean you're in UDVs, yeah. so I made fucking trophy trucks, you're running to car, you like boats, you like yeah. muscle cars. Well, I don't do the boat thing fucked. like you guys. <laughs> I like boats. That I just the boat I own, I bought. I just drive it. And if it breaks, I go to the shop. It's under warranty and they fix it. Yeah. I got to, the boat thing gets out of hand quick because it's no different than cars. Also, yeah. you start learning yeah. about. Dude, it gets super. Out of hand. I, I tried like dipping my toes into it and get like my dream was always. I grew up a, like a 80s, 90s kid. So I loved cigarette boats. Oh, the fucking cigarette top gun was the shit. <clears throat> right. So before like the market blew up and they went crazy, I got a 96. Oof. Right. All fucking neon colors, yeah, so super rad. Super nineties, <laughs> so, dude. So, but like today, that's fucking bad. I mean, it's like super yeah. in style, right? The nineties shit, but big blocks and everything. And I smoked one drive in it, and I'm like, I'm watching like these motors and just thinking like oil pressures fluctuating on the one. And I'm like, I don't want to sign up for like rebuilding Forever. these yeah. fucking motors. And I'm like, I'll fix this drive, and this fucker's gone. I'm done with it. <laughs> oh, done. Nice. Done with this. That, that's that can be an expensive hobby but i i got in and out of it before it costs any money yeah i i'm trying to stay away from the boat thing it's wild that i'm not i mean i'm very novice on the boat stuff but it's so wild to me that you never meet that guy that's had that boat for 25 years that's my boat that's my it's always they just got it no matter how old it is yeah. and they keep it for like 18 months. You know, the a dude, brand new one. And the dude who's got like the 86, like 32 foot Chris craft that says oh. misbehaving on the back. <laughs> <laughs> that dude's He's had that. Had He's fucking yeah. had that thing forever. Right. Uh, so Otherwise yeah. they cycle through them. Yeah. yeah. Right before it's about to get expensive, it becomes the next guy's problem. Yeah, he has like to spend some money on it. And it's a hot potato. <laughs> What's well, wild, like for us, is like 2007, 8, 9, dude, it, uh, like we have a place at the river in Havasu and it was getting ridiculous. The boats were getting insane. And then like 2010 to like 2017, it was yeah. more back down to yep. like 21, 25 foot boats. Were, Boat industry disappeared for like yeah, 10 years, just but gone. I would say in the last like four or five, COVID. Yep. But, and even right before COVID, the boats again. Now it's the, Dude, the inboard the out, or the outboards with you know the four hundred fifty, five hundred fifty, or five fifties. Yeah, thirteen seven fifties on the back of it. Dude, the boats yeah. are getting now. They're at, we're at we're in Havasu, like three hundred miles from the ocean, and there's forty foot center consoles. Yeah, going like there's not even a wave. Yeah, the water's like, flat. Worse, there's yeah. going to be a ripple, maybe. But right? the boat the boat industry has completely gone back. Same with the sand car industry. The sand car industry was. A lot of UTVs. Now yeah. you're seeing cars with, dude. Is the sand car stuff coming back? Oh, big time. Big yeah, time see, right it, the sand car stuff like died, oh, gone. Big time. And then it's, it, it seems it. like it's coming back. The problem with it, like the UTVs are so fucking <laughs> convenient. Yeah. You know, and that's like, I've got the sand carts in pieces right now, <laughs> but you constantly find yourself like, I should just sell it and get a UTV. Because it's, yeah. it's, it's like but a the, job. But the big ones, like twin turbo, yeah. UTV, or a twin turbo, like sand cars are coming back big time right now. You can't beat like that fucking thrill. That oh, 100%. I think that's the number out of anything motorsports, anything I've ever driven. I've never done crazy yeah. shit like you, but the thrill of that, like twelve hundred horsepower in a lightweight sand car, Oof. it's every motorsport crammed into one. It's like a giant dirt bike, right? It's the yeah. acceleration's like a drag car. It's just everything right there. You jump it, dude. It's like in anything car. The uh, t- uh, Tatum, who is like the the owner's daughter of Tatum Motorsports. She worked for Monster Energy for a while. Okay. So like she, they went out to Glamis with us one time to try like some of the big cars they give us rides in in the dunes and you're sitting there going like, this is out of control. Yeah. Like you can go, so, it, it feels like you're floating in the dunes and when you're duning it just with that much power to go up and be able to pull that, e- like the handbrake and just rip it. Yeah. That you're There is no other feeling like it. And sitting passenger scares the shit yeah, out of me. That's being a driver. How does it work on oh, the passenger God, side? God, dude, I am not a fan, dude. It's just sitting there just every time I can tighten up my seatbelt. Like, <laughs> and you no. haven't gotten into, you don't have a sand car? No. Nope. Just I've, UTVs? Just stuff? UTVs. Like being that, 
like a factory race on the UTV side, it was just easier. Plus, yep. like I said, I already got the motor thing. Dude, they're pulling their motors out every season. Yeah. And yeah, I've, dude, I got a Razor Turbo, and he's got the Tatum Long Travel Sand Car. I think I put gas in mine, and that's the extent of it. It's four years old. I put a, I put a belt time. on it once. You, when yeah, I borrowed you it, drove yeah. it, you put a belt on it. <laughs> What's the He's UTV to get? Lately. If the guy's going out there to get right now. The new one, the Pro-R, non-turboed. It's it's 2,000 cc's. And, well, the Can-Am? No, the, razor, the razor, Polaris okay. Razor. But it's four-cylinder. Uh, it's like 230 horsepower stock. The way they designed the belt and where the belt is, it runs like 40% cooler than a turbo belt, whether it be a Can-Am or a Razor. The, where the belt location is in front of the motor, it's so it's the box is so big that it runs way cooler, way more efficient. So now belt temperatures are way down, which belt temps is what spikes and blows them up. But uh, the car in California, you don't have to wear, you don't have to wear a helmet. Not that I'm promoting not wearing a helmet, but because it's over a thousand cc's, it's considered a car. So you can actually not have to wear a helmet and get a ticket. Um, but overall, like, they're a little, sus I mean, well, you guys are into suspension, but, like, it's the first car that the front coilover is mounted off the bottom arm instead of the top arm, where if you look at, like, a standard Can-Am or an older Razor, they have the upper arm completely beefed up and strong as shit to hold the coilover, and then the bottom arm is two pieces of tube, where you're like, if the car bottoms out on the ground, the those two pieces of tube are what are going to get, that's what's going to hit the rocks. It's totally backwards for an yeah. off-road car. So Polaris did a phenomenal job of like going back and just not evolving off of an existing platform. They just changed it all. Every Damn. bolt's bigger. The uprights are bigger. The bolt, I mean, every bolt, the axles, the front diff, the transmission in the back and the rear diff are, I mean, insanely built. The car, that industry is firing right now. So from a, like a professional, I've been watching that crazy Can Am, which just it's hard to hard to love it. Like that it, new one with the yeah. yeah what's your what's your take on that? I I, I get I, it. I, I, get I the understand concept. as the geometry goes. I understand, right. but for for me, the hard part is if you really look at the chassis, they did not strengthen the weakness of the chassis. So there, those cars have been known right behind the uh, the back of the arm to have some weak links as far as creating cracks in the frame. And they didn't fix any of that. So like the thing still has some weakness to it where, you know, they, they evolved, they evolved off the existing platform and did a lot to make it better. But to me, there's still some weakness. And that's where I look at the razor. Dude, they just went and made a whole new frame and put all new parts on it. Hmm. So that's also a six speed sequential, right? Yeah. Which on the can really? Yeah. 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 Which the really Razor or the, the Yamaha that never really took off. I thought it'd be bitching to shift. I like yeah. that's my that's my one hang up with UTVs. Not shifting. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's never you're never in the, in the power, power band where you yeah. want it to be. But yeah. I also think that after time, like you sit there and go like, the people that are shifting, it's like they're all even when you're like, okay, I just want to take a breath. You're always shifting. Like even when you're just taking the family for a little putt around, it's yeah. first, second, third. I it's funny actually. I built a uh, Camaro with a sequential in it. Now it's the worst thing I ever did because you're always shifting. Yeah. No matter what, you have to shift up and down. You can never go to neutral and yeah. let it float, right? When you're in fifth, you got to get to neutral. But yeah, what do you do then? Because you're so into this shit for your kids, your boys. Like it seems like for me, I get my son's twelve. Oh, really? And since he was like ten, there's nothing that exists for like a kid that wants to go fast. You know, like, cause you get the yeah. little razor, was yeah. it a 110, yeah. which is like a, it's like a toy. Yeah. And he'll, he'll break that thing in half. Right. I, uh, so. What are they, <laughs> what are they rocking? I'm, uh, so I'm doing the whole motor, motorcycle only thing. I want them to understand that, okay. you know, when you crash. The consequences. Cost yeah. Well, like for <laughs> me, like you put them in a UTV and they go and roll it over. If they, if they think that's normal, then they're going to get in a bigger car and think that it's okay to fuck it up. So like my thought is like break a leg. I'm gonna break teach him. Yeah. Dude, well, if you want to go, yeah, if you're gonna go ride I don't like do an, that anymore. Yeah. If you're gonna ride like an idiot, like you're gonna be the one that gets fucked up. Yeah. So like, but I also think that like dirt bike riders become the best at everything. Like in our industry, if you look at a guy like Jimmy Johnson, and you know you look at some of these top racers in all forms, do they all have a motocross background? They might not have been pro, but they all came from dirt bikes. So I, it's tough. I'm going to get my kid, uh, into go-kart racing. Okay. That's yeah, I looked into that for my son. How, how old is your kid? Uh, my son's nine. Oh, okay. So I'm nine, nine and eight. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm looking at doing the go-kart thing. I, there's just nothing around here. It's like an hour and a half, two hour drive oof. to get to a track. Yeah. It's, it's tough. That's the tough thing with everything with like, you know, California kids versus Midwest kids. Like my son's a skateboarder. That's what we do. He, you know, but really? he doesn't have the, like the luxury of just like outdoor skate parks, like right in town all fucking year round. And yeah, then you so go we have like four of them within three miles of our house. Right. But you go out, like we go down to Florida, you go out to California and these kids are just fucking unbelievable. Cause that's, they could do it all day long, every day. But Same I also, thing with motocross and all that. It's yeah. Like, but I also look at it like, and that's what, one of my concerns is he's like, my oldest son is like, he's super talented, but I also worry that he's like, because he's so around it that he doesn't care as much. And that's one of my fears is like, I don't want him to grow up just going, like, sure. I can do what I want. It's like, no, you can't, dude. You're either in or you're out. Like, I don't want you to be that kid that just has a talent, but you put 60% effort into it because yeah. you think you can't, you know, you're blessed to be able to do it when you want. Sure. So, but I have the, it's, yeah, we, I have the, it's, I'm growing up right now as far as uh, trying to do what's right for the kid thing. Cause I've never played sports in my whole life. I, you know, I raced motocross growing up. My dad loved it. I loved it. And then. Now I'm like, I want my kids to be around teams. Like having employees has really made me understand that some that of people my, suck. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, my, some of my biggest, some of the best employees I have are like now that I'm uh, like being around them more is some of the best leaders in my, at Curry Enterprises are ones that were like leaders of a, a soccer, you know, team sports. Team, yeah. Team sports. But like, yeah, they were the one that was like, oh, I, you know, I was the captain on a football team and you're like. That doesn't mean anything except for the fact that like, hey, you might be having a bad day. So, hey, can you can you not be so fucking hard on him today? And like he's really good at like making the morale in the shop better. And I'm going like, fuck, dude, I've never even realized that. Like yeah. you're having a shitty day. We all talk shit and that's just what we that's do. The, that's every single person I've ever hired. It's in like the interview thing when I talk about it, it doesn't necessity. It's not a make it or break that's it just thing. The it Alabama doesn't. football thing with you. No, I doesn't make you fuckers are bred for that shit. It doesn't make it or break it of like if you're going to get hired or whatever. It's just kind of learning about your background. It's, hey, tell me a little bit about how you grew up, blah, blah, blah. And then what team sports did you play, you know? And it tells you a little bit about that kind of that person, you know? And again, doesn't mean you're going to get hired or not. But like, oh, yeah, you know, I played baseball. I played football. I played soccer. I did this, blah, blah, Okay, no problem. You've you've dealt with adversity. That's right. You've probably dealt with a coach that like maybe we talked oh. a little mean to you, you know? Or you've, you've, you've felt losing. And then you kept it and you didn't like it, you know, and it, t it teaches a lot of things about somebody, you know, playing yeah. any type of sports. Yeah. I actually Pick have a teammate I, to get the rest of the team going better. Yep. Yeah, I have we're all like, in this so, together. All that, all that type of stuff. I actually, that's one of my like things that I've learned about, like being a dad around team sports is my oldest son that puts half effort in because he's, he's got the talent, but he does half effort. Like this year, my youngest son who to, he's, he has to push harder and work harder, be better at things. Dude, his football team went and won the championship. And my son, I'm like, dude, just because you put in 80% half the games, I'm like, now your brother's a champion. That shit's on his fucking collar. We just life. talked about that the other podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Being born with, with talent or work ethic. Dude, yeah. my, my young son. That's a great my, example. But I watched my oldest son, literally a fire was lit. I'm going like, every, I'm sitting to tell him like, your brother literally... You talk shit on him because he was trying so hard all year long and you were fucking hanging out with your buddies, not trying as hard. And like, look at what happened. Now it, he's the guy. We're celebrating him tonight, not you. And dude, it's like, <laughs> but it, by doing that though, it literally got yeah. him where he's like, fuck that, dude. Like, uh, I'm ready. I'm I want some ice cream. No, right. winners get ice cream. That's fucking A. <laughs> hey. Whatever he Give me that piece for closers. <laughs> oh, man. And it was crazy. What, like, but watching my kids, like, grow up and being in that competitive I first I'm I'm super competitive obviously we probably are competitive but I I love to win and like seeing my youngest who like I know is trying hard and not maybe blessed with all the skills like yep. fuck man that hard work dude it, it shows every time dude he goes out there and puts so much effort into it and like to win That's and awesome. like watching my oldest going like it, you're never going to win I and you might get lucky but that a championship is not luck winning some Winning some games could be luck, but it's, it's, the, it's the it's the one constant. It's the one thing you are that you can control. Yep, that's right. You are completely in control of your destiny when it comes to how hard you work and how much effort you put into. It doesn't guarantee a victory. Yep. But if 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 you know when you lay your head down at night that you gave it a hundred percent, you can almost be 
more okay with whatever that outcome is. Because if it's like, I was way more talented than that kid. Well, the, the, he beat you. I mean, I could have if I would have. That's right. I mean, I should have done this and I should have done that. Well, guess what? You're still a fucking loser. That's right. That's what's going to be, you're branded with. You should have went fucking harder. Yeah. No. See, that's right. I'm I'm short. I'm fucking not the most in shape fit guy here, but that's all. For me, I'm like, I'll just outwork everyone. If I have to, I wake up early every day and I'll grind. Like, I love to work. I, that's the only, like my youngest, me and him, like, we got a lot similar to him. That's what I'm like, dude, as long as you work hard, I can go, you'll go anywhere you want in life. But I, I know that hard work will outpay anything all day long. Right. So, oh, yeah. But it is fun, dude. The kid thing is, dude, watching them grow up and learn all this stuff and being a dad, learn all it's like, dude, it's freaking crazy right now. Like, oh, yeah. All these, li- and being, that's one thing COVID was the biggest blessing for me. I traveled, I was traveling 30, 40 weeks a year for the, you know, from 2015 to 2020. I was traveling almost every weekend, if not every week of the year. That's just what I did. My wife understand, very blessed to have her, but we fully were invested in my career and no one else's. Even though I had kids, everything came from- They were super young then though, anyway. You don't, yeah. don't, don't yeah. remember yeah. a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but COVID though made it realize that, dude, they're only, yep. they're, man, they're, they're only young now. once. Yep. And they're that shit, like now that they're eight, nine, like, I, I don't want to be that. Well, if, if I would have never, my concern was if COVID never happened, would I have never seen it and just huh. live that style of life right. forever. I look at COVID going like, dude, they gave me the opportunity to open my eyes and go like, dude, I need to be home. Yeah. Like, I want to be a dad and sure. like, r- having a business to fall back on. The only way that business can be there if I'm around to run it. So it's like, unless I'm getting paid, like I ain't going on these events. We used to go around the, I mean, we traveled the world. I was very blessed, but it's like. It's a cool experience. Oh, 100%. But having a family, it changes all those experiences. Because every time you leave, you're like, I just want to go home. Yeah. So, but I, I will say yes to traveling the world. I would never give it back. Except for now, my wife's like, let's go on vacation. I'm like, fuck traveling. Dude, the <laughs> air the shit, airport dude. and the baggage. 20-hour 20, 20 <laughs> flight to go where you want to go. That, yeah. Can't we go to Mexico? Let's just get some steaks and like, like hang out by the pool. Uh, 100%. <laughs> so, 100%. Uh, first car in store. All right. You, you, you feeling gassy? tonight first car yeah so we do we do that's standard a, questions with pretty much all yeah. guests right that's a tough one sometimes man. if we're feeling it we'll we'll, we'll guess that is some of the one. answers to that if you're not feeling it then, then that's fine no i'm feeling it. it's just that's this is an anomaly man i mean all right so crazy. you're 40 so <laughs> family with so much motor you were driving background. you were driving in what oh two oh three uh no 97 uh, no, 90, yeah, 97 yeah 97 i was graduated in oh Two oh one. Yeah, I graduated in ninety seven. Oh, no yeah. You're old as shit. Yeah, I know. But if I graduated <laughs> in ninety seven, I was I was uh, got my license at. Well, they started. Lo- they started putting roads and stuff in what like ninety yeah, nine in Alabama. School yeah, a lot longer than most people though. It was like a six year program for you. Yeah, we all went. We all went for four, four years. years to high what year did you get your license? It had been ninety seven. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but you're forty. Yeah, yeah. I'm forty five. Yeah, that's five years difference. I got my license when I was in '95, when I was turned 16. The math doesn't add up. I Maybe graduated you're doing the math though. Yeah, do the math. I graduated in 2001. Yep. Three years earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm two years earlier because you get your license at 16. No, I got mine when I was a sophomore. Yeah. Yeah. So my sophomore. birthday's in December, so I got a, I got yeah. my license. So you do the math the other way. You were yeah. born in '83. Yeah. 16 years later. 99. Like we said, yeah. Like, <laughs> like it's not what you. Said. Yeah. yeah, no. Both of us yeah. said it. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. We were both like yeah. ninety. Fuck, I knew it wasn't stupid. Yeah. Uh, 98, 99. I don't know if that validates it. Like the, uh, uh, yeah, so whatever, dude. These okay. are fucking details. These are like right? little fucking it means details that are that important when it's when you're guessing a first. The car. late nineties. Uh, okay, so, but, granddad, and dad, new car, car family, or used car. Oh, used. Car family. But you were you were racing dirt bikes at that time. Yep. All right. You're going S10. That's no, we're not going back S10. Okay. I just know it's it's got to it's got to be a truck. Uh, you got to haul the dirt bike. Um, <laughs> it's an OBS Chevy truck. It's an OBS. It's two wheel drive too, and it's not four wheel drive. California. It's I'm just guessing. I'm just drive. it's I'm going with OBS. Uh, it could be a 454 SS, but it's black. It's a black OBS truck. 
Just that's my that's my. I'm thinking that he put the work in. That this was like a little bit of a project. All right, you've got grandpas swapping V8s. S10. No, OBS S10s. They didn't come with V8s. So a little 350 swap. That's right around the time of the ZZ4. Maybe it even had the hot cam kit. I don't know. <laughs> okay. It's possible. So right? square body S10 with a with nine a inch swap. Fucking nine inch rear end in the back of that thing. White. Dirt bike white, slide right in the back. White S10 oh, yeah. with a V8 swap. <laughs> I'm thinking CJ now, and he pulled a trailer, but yeah, the cheap thing, yeah. Uh huh. CJ, <laughs> frosted chips and all. <laughs> <laughs> I had curly hair; that shit never worked. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing on this one. Nothing. All right, it's gonna be a fucking it's box good. body or something. Yeah, and he's like, I just drove my motorcycle out the back out door. Left, left field. <laughs> I wanted to say Mustang, but yeah, yeah. so no, nope. So. Actual first project that I didn't drive ever. My dad bought me a 95, 95 or 93 Ford F-150 uh, that didn't run. And then never finished, but it was a project that we were going to build it into a pre-runner. So me and my grandpa and my dad were out of town one time. We were going to make it. It was supposed to just be leaf springs in the back with i beams in the front. Dude, my gran- my dad was on a work trip and me and my grandfather fucking cut all the leaf springs out of it. And then it turned into a fucking... Four link. Link it. Yeah, my dad was pissed. But long story, super funny. But actually, my first car was a 93 Ford Ranger, single cab, four cylinder, stick shift. Splash. Uh, dude, it was gray and it, dude, no air condition. And somebody, before we bought it, punched the freaking the stereo with the CD thing that came up the top. They punched it. So it was like the black splur dot. Yeah, oh, yeah. On the but LCD. F- yeah. Six shift. I remember that yeah. shifter. And the boot on it. was huge. It was like a fucking Mac truck. You had, you talk about 28 inches of travel in your trophy truck. That's how long it took from (laughs) first to second gear. The the only upgrade I had was I put, when my dad lifted a Jeep that he had, it, the Ranger and the Jeeps had the same bullpen. I put the stock Rubicon tires and wheels on it. 31s. That was it. Damn. I did nothing. Like my dad, he wasn't a big, I never got no bad. I got to drive some Jeeps once in a while, but I never had. Dude, it was stock. I mean, Shit. I had that for, uh, yeah, until I, I had an XJ after that. But I drove that for three years in all my high school career. Dude, we're just, we're missing with the Cali guys. It's a culture that oh, dude, we're the, not when really When you said S10, I got like six friends that had the S10 white really? flare fenders in the front, but nothing in the back. Front was five inches wider than the back. Tail light zip tied oh, to the frame. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. Somebody uh, got them. White fiberglass, no paint. Oh, the, it's crazy how big that was for so like the utv kind of ruined it because now kids are like i got thirty thousand dollars and i bought a utv and then i tow it behind a nice car where before it was like dude you had fifty thousand dollars into a piece of shit because you put coilovers on it and you put a nine inch in the back you put beams on it i now, still couldn't drive it yeah no <clears throat> <sighs> times have changed what, but- what, what what killed the ranger i never did i just we sold it to buy a cherokee when we were a uh, class called Jeep Speed on off road got popular, so I built like a pre runner, had a 44 in the back and a beam in the front, little pre runner. W- that would have been my S10, but it was a, uh, I didn't build that until I was 18 or 19. So I was straight stick shift Ranger stock. I didn't even, not, I mean, not nothing, not even like spacers, nothing. It looked back now going, like, I don't even know why I did what I did. Not, no speakers or nothing? Nothing. No. Damn. And yeah. some six by nines in a box in the back. Yeah, I know. Because yeah. the single cap on those trucks, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, but it you had about never, that much room. Yeah, and that's why I said six by nines. Oh, six yeah. Six by nines <laughs> in a little air, truck uh, box. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's our right. first, you might be, which is a sign because you're <laughs> a pro race car driver that you didn't wreck your first car. We've done like 200 of these. I think 199 people wrecked their first car. When we oh, had that shit. Everybody's wrecked and totaled it. <laughs> it totaled it, not just wrecked it. Yeah. Yeah, I did not total, do that. Total. I've been in some cars. With other people that had parents' money and fuck shit up, but not myself. Good to you. Yeah, like yeah, you said race car driver. That's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> We're We're born some, with a natural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Jr. totaled something. Yeah. We've had some guys on here that totaled some shit. He's just a little more responsible. Lucky. He got lucky. A little more yeah. responsible. Uh, best piece of advice you've ever received. Best piece of advice. Uh. I would say if uh, 
now looking at it as I'm getting older, my gr- my grandpa's whole saying was, if you can't afford what you really want, then don't buy it at all. Wait until you can afford it. I'd say that I used to like, when I was younger, I'd, I'd be in a fucking, da- grandpa found a boat, 21 footer dude, it's got a jet boat, but the motor don't run. He'd be like, you don't need it. Just wait until you can buy one that runs. And then, you know, like as I got older, like I used to want to buy race cars that were pieces of shit and then I'll rebuild them and make them nice. And he's like, you're going to have more money in it that way. But for me, I think that piece of advice would be to wait and to hustle and to get the capital that it takes and needs to do anything in life right. Buy one, think, cry, buy once, cry once. Yeah, I think that, it's well, good. it's not even that. I think even like when it comes to just doing everything I look at now, going like, man, if I would have had that piece of shit, first of all, I didn't even need the boat because in reality, the boat was a hobby when I was actually trying to be a race car driver. Like if I would have spent the five grand on the boat, and then I probably would have been five grand into the damn motor and then another two or three grand into the jet pump that that would have been all that money away from racing. So yeah. I look at it going like it wasn't so much about the boat. It was more like you don't even you have other things in life that the money should be spent on. Yeah. So focus on what's going to make you successful and, and just that's a great, great advice. It's good. Good advice for uh, drag racers. You know, because those <laughs> dudes, they will buy like the cheapest car, project car you can get. And Always then, lacking the motor. And then over the next, oh, yeah. like, everything set up. Over the next two to three years, put like six figures yeah. in that car, which is just wait like a little bit longer mm-hmm. because at the end of it, it's worth like nothing because it's like the most asinine, like off year vehicle yeah. ever. I, I'd agree on that. <laughs> But yeah, it's just one of those things that I think like looking at it now, I probably would have a jet boat, a couple jet skis, a bunch of dirt bikes, probably two or three dirt bike trailers because I could have got good deals on them. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd have all the shit that you're sitting there going like instead of buying a race car or a, a tow, you know, chase trucks and yeah. nicer trailers, like I would be that guy. Back then I would look at it and be like, fuck, I would have had a 25 pieces of shit out. It's a yard out, full of shit. Just garbage that, <laughs> you know, you could have had one nice thing. But now the problem is nothing. They're worth all half. Best uh, car or truck movie? Oh, I mean, I would say, I don't know. I, I'm a, I'm a comedian. I like, like movies like Talladega Nights. Good, yeah, good pick. Solid pull. Good yeah. pick. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's no fan. Step Brothers, but it's, it's good. I, uh, no. It's up there. I, I do love Step, Step Brothers too. Step Brothers yeah. is it's the king. It's the goat. Nothing beats Step Brothers. Talladega Nights is great, man. I can't get my, to my daughter, she's 10, my son's 12. They never stop reciting the baby Jesus line. Oh, God. And, and like people who don't know what it's from, like, there's <laughs> something, something, wrong, with something wrong with your kids. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, from the movie. Funny. I just got a meme sent to me, though. It's from uh, uh, Step Brothers, though, when he was beating on the drums. And, he, you know, it's it's like, you know, when you're driving in the fast end and that fucking slow car rolls in front of you. It's like, what? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> it's just like, it's. Oh, so real life. Those fucking guys are... They it's are so holy good. Shit. They just don't make movies like this no. I anymore. agree. Both of those are fucking bangers. Yeah. Talent. Talent, my, talent. Uh, my kids just went to go watch a movie, and my wife was reading about it because she didn't know about it, and it, the movie was like... It's some underwater movie, but they're like, the mermaid very much so looks like a girl, and the... You know, the merman looks like a man. I'm like, they had to write that in there to show the description. Yeah. If you have, it's some kids movie, but that's the shit that is today. It's something like, it says it in the name yeah. merman. Yeah. Oh, but they're showing that he Mermaid. has no shirt on and you know, hmm. she has boobs. It's, it's and the thing we're looking at. I mean, you literally saw him put his nutsack on the drum set. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. like that's, you, knew, you knew that was a man. A hundred percent. That's man. Oh, Don't. so good, like, dude. Uh, so true. I'm going to put my nutsack <laughs> on your <laughs> truth. <truth's in>. What? <laughs> uh, we generally go, most of the time it's best SEMA story. And you can go SEMA story if you want. However, however, we will open it up to best race, event, traveling. This is, everybody's got that story, right? So everybody's been out drinking with friends. This is the one that you go to. Everyone's kind of like, oh, I, I got a funny story. And you're like, guys, shut up and listen Hold to my this. Yeah. yeah, this is this, this is one. I mean, I was young at SEMA, so I've had some, the raging parties. I've tried to get away from that a little bit, because, fuck, if we could have, forget half the shit I said the night before. What's the craziest party at SEMA? Oh, shit, I don't even remember. Toyo Tires used to do a bunch of good ones. I'm friends with a bunch of guys from Toyo. They used to, th- or at least they knew where every party was. It seemed yeah. like, I honestly don't even, I, dude, I haven't been to a party in SEMA in like five years. Now I'm like, 
fucking suit and tie. I have to go out to dinners and stuff. Yeah. Until it's like nine o'clock at night. By the time you get done with dinner, it's like ten o'clock. Ready to go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got to be at the booth in the morning because we got meeting. It's like shit's changed. I don't like back in the day though, boy. When I was just parting, trying to find. There, yeah, there used to be some good ones. I don't. I don't know. Well, uh, what's the? There's the one that has the pool on the outside. It's up on the top. Um, Dre's. It's a Dre's. <laughs> it's at the very top, and the pool's outside. You got the DJ things on the inside. There's some good ones there, pushing people in the jacuzzis, and the uh, but I haven't done it in a while. But fuck, I don't know. I was committed to projects that were I could never get done, and fuck pulling all nighters for weeks on end to end up limo tinting the windows to make it so it looked finished. But <laughs> there's no interior in the car, and oh, we've fuck. been there. We've been there. I'm, we never had to tint them. We've it, we came close. We I, talked about it. Yeah, like well, worst case scenario. I had to take the windows. <laughs> did the roll cage thing. I wanted everything to be leather wrap, but the only way to do the leather wrap stuff was after SEMA. And then it would have been all raw with holes in it because there's no reason to put everything in the holes until you put all the. I'm like, we're fucking wrapping the windows. This is it. There's no, I can't do this. Well, dude, I know you got to catch a plane. We got to do oh, a yeah. quick whiskey review and then we'll be rocking out. We got a special whiskey tonight, don't we? Yeah. We had. Uh, our uh, a young boy swing by the shop, K thirty two customs. Yeah, Logan. Logan was picking up a chassis. What's he building? He's a, he's a grown man. I would wouldn't consider him. He's young. He's young. We just use that term within <laughs> loosely. The shop. You know, you get yeah. like a twenty something year old. He's young a young boy. boy. Yeah, young boy. Yeah, he's out of Kansas. And so he brought a Kansas bourbon. He brought whiskey. some West Bottoms Whiskey Company signature blend, Kansas City whiskey, uh, ninety four proof, blended. I think it was a little surprising. It is good stuff. Man. It's good, actually. Surprising yeah. for what we you're always skeptical Kansas when it doesn't. City. Yeah, when it doesn't Not come out known of for the bourbon. Louisville, Kentucky. Known for the barbecue sauce, but Kansas City is barbecue sauce. Yeah, barbecue, right? Yeah, I never knew that until we went to the airport there. I was like, there's a lot of barbecue shit here. Yeah, <laughs> KC masterpiece back in the day. Oh yeah, Kansas never City. never put that together. Yeah, hmm. how about it? Good whiskey though. It was. We appreciate the uh, contribution to yeah. our uh, bad habit. That's uh, you've gotten yourself two shout outs now. I know you brought the whiskey. That's nice. All right, let's. <laughs> <laughs> let's Going to charge him he for picked the third. Up a chassis. He picked up a chassis. Yeah, che- everybody check out. You need to check out Logan at K thirty two Customs on Instagram. He, dude, young guy, super nice, extremely talented. It's, I love it. It's nice to see in the industry of the guys that are doing it seemingly the right way. Talent and attitude and Build good stuff. Building good yeah. shit. Yeah. There's there's getting less and less. So it is, I believe me, I'm a big I'm a big fan of craftsmanship and yeah. seeing yeah. all the people building and the youth, stuff. man. Anybody hundred percent. Anybody that's getting after it at yeah. a young age is always impressive. Agree. Yeah, especially it, since it, it is we're a dying trade. Getting older. It's been awesome, man. I'm glad you could make it. Uh, safe travels. I know you got King of the Hammers here coming up. Yeah. Good luck. No, thank you guys for the have invite. fun. Appreciate you coming out, man. Badass facility. It's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, need to come out here in the summer and actually check it all out. Like, yeah, not this 10 degrees. Yeah, yeah get you behind the wheel of something. Right? Oh, f- yeah. We need to do something. We need to get that trophy truck out here or something. We need to do some oh, collab we're, or we're something. We're going out by him. Yeah, what are you, you going to do around here with it? Yeah, drive around like a yeah. lot in a trophy truck. Yeah, so come out. You guys come out to California and I'll show you guys all. Dude, literally, you guys all come out to California. You fly into Ontario. I'll, I'll get you all taken care of. How often do you go out to Glamis? Uh, I only go probably three or four times a year. So. Bring when, the trophy truck or just no? Lasers? See what to do. The things a pain. They has to prep. Yeah. Uh, I have. We got a bunch of toys. What's so. the latest you can go out there before it starts getting too damn hot? Well, so I mean, well, probably May. Yeah. So after that, what you do? Like, uh, I have some friends that do. They go out and they do it at night. Like they'll drive out during the day do and it then rip it all night and then drive home the next day. Hmm. So you got to know the terrain for that. I feel you like. Can. You got to know. Yourself yeah. up Good lights. Good. Yeah. Good lights. But yeah, if you guys, when you guys ever want to come up to California, well. Yeah, we're going to hit you up, man. Set it up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate it, dude. No. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to Oil and Whiskey, Ironclad Original. If you like the show, be sure to leave a rating or review. You know all the shit. You've been listening long enough. Thanks again, Casey. We'll see you again next week.